Hey everybody, welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. Today we were talking to Dr. Stuart Shanker about his book, Self-Reg, and we're going to be learning all about self-regulation, the neuroscience behind it, and maybe some tools that we can use when we're feeling a little bit stressed out. So, which I am right now, because I just rushed <laughs> over here for a doctor's appointment. So welcome, Stuart. Thanks, CJ. So let's start off with a couple of definitions. What, what is, how would you define self-regulation? Um, so <laughs> let me give you this answer with a warning. Okay. We did a study uh, a couple of years ago and identified 447 different definitions of self-regulation. Okay. <laughs> we'll be here for a while, I guess. Well, not really, because I mean, this was a big surprise to me because I came to Canada from Oxford and um, we only had one definition of self-regulation over there. And <laughs> it was the original definition that was um, made by an American biologist called Walter Bradford Cannon. And it's a real simple definition. It's how do we manage stress? Mm. Now, the cool thing about uh, uh, Cannon's definition is that it allows us to distinguish between what we call maladaptive ways of managing stress and adaptive or growth promoting ways. Okay. Uh, so a maladaptive way, a maladaptive way would be say drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and what drinking does is it of course sedates you for a while. Uh, and it gives you a little bit of energy because it is, of course, a sugar. Mm -hmm. But then when the effects wear off, you feel even worse mm -hmm. uh, because you've done nothing to address, um, you know, what was the reasons why you needed uh, a stimulant in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're shooting for. Um, we're looking, I, I was very interested when we started the show, I'll just tell all your viewers, uh, CJ has been rushing. To, I have been. <laughs> Perfect to, introduction to your material. Yeah. And uh, she did something um, which is the sort of S, the epitome of growth promoting uh, self regulation. Uh, what she did was she said she needed a moment to ground herself, uh, closed her eyes, uh, did some breathing. And uh, it was a new person 30 seconds later. So that's a lesson for everybody. <laughs> this stuff, I mean, at the end of the day, the stuff actually works. So, Yes, I'm a good poster child for... So the, both, the, both ends. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I just... I, I'm actually in um, an incredible pain from an ankle and back problem and I'm about to get on a plane and I was able to squeeze uh, in an acupuncturist appointment who and this gentleman always runs late and I said I cannot be late <laughs> and then of course I was late <laughs> but oh, luckily by three minutes versus 20 minutes how the appointment started 20 minutes later yeah, and then and so that I called and I thought, okay, I'm going to be, I may be five minutes late on average. And then as I drove back, Stuart, I ran into like, there was construction. <laughs> there was like every red light on earth. And I thought, okay, there's really nothing I could do at this point, but you just sit here. So I took a couple side roads and then I got here at miraculously at 1249. According to my watch, I have no idea because by the time I got to my computer, I was three minutes late. So I have no idea what happened. But yes, the breathing um, was um, I was I was basically trying to uh, manage my stress. So I was trying to self-regulate myself. Now, <laughs> I, I read something interesting in some of the materials that so there's there's there are things I've heard of, you know, the limbic brain and the flight, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm an expert on that, but give me a little bit of basics on that. And then one thing that was new to me is the interbrain, which is the idea of yeah. how others stress us out. So you instantly come, actually, what was interesting when I called you, your voice instantly calmed me down. I was like, oh God, no, this guy's like calm. And it just <laughs> calmed me down. <laughs> 
So tell me about the neuroscience and how it relates to stress. Okay, so you just identified a whole bunch of really important points. Uh, let's start off with um, the first question. Uh, back in the 60s, an American neuroscientist called Paul McLean uh, came up with a model that has really transformed all the work that developmental neuroscientists do. Uh, and he said, the human brain is really not one brain, it's three brains in one. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very old brain, the reptilian brain, and that was selected around 300 million years ago. Uh, and it was to serve the needs of singletons. That means a solitary creature, like a mm -hmm. lizard or a turtle. Um, these are creatures that are born alone, that stay alone. Um, and so they needed a primitive defense mechanism and that mechanism was fight or flight. Mm -hmm. uh, nature decided that this was such a neat mechanism for protection that when it evolved the next species, mammals, about 100 million years after that, it kept the reptilian brain and it superimposed on that the limbic brain. The, the, it's called the paleomammalian brain. Uh, now, there's a couple of things that are really huge for guys like me. One of them is that when McLean came up with this idea, um, it was just an idea. We couldn't actually see it. We, our, our, our technology was kind of crude. But in the 80s and 90s, they figured out ways for us to see how the limbic brain works. Hmm. And in my own neural lab, that's all we studied. We studied the limbic system. Hmm. So we learned some really important things. The limbic system is uh, constantly scanning the environment, looking for danger, looking for safety. And it could be hmm. noises. It could be other people. They'll look on their face. And that limbic brain was preserved in us. So there's a kind of an alarm system inside that brain called the amygdala. And if it, ha if it sees what it thinks is a threat, it instantly sends us into hypervigilance. It uh, triggers very quickly a descent into the reptilian brain, into fight or flight. Mm. And then on top of all those two, I'll come back to that in one second, okay, CJ? Mm -hmm. On top of those two, we have our new brain, the neocortex, and that was selected around 10 million years ago, and then it just got more, uh, bigger and bigger, actually. Mm -hmm. It sits on top of this limbic brain. Uh, so here's, a, here's the kind of key phrase we use. The limbic brain operates beneath the threshold of conscious awareness. So if my limbic brain sees somebody and thinks there's something about that guy that uh, you know I think is threatening, it sends a message. It puts me into hypervigilance, and I have no control over this. I can't choose this. I can't. I can't influence it, um, and I can instantly go into fight or flight. Mm. Uh, and this is a big problem. Like a lot of the work we do is with uh, parents and educators who don't understand when a kid's behavior is intentional, deliberate, the kid's acting up, and when a kid's behavior is limbic. Oh. And if, it's, if it's limbic, he didn't choose. Oh. And if you punish a kid for oh. a limbic behavior, you are um, reinforcing a trajectory that's going to go worse and worse and worse for that child. Oh. And you know, one of our big sayings is, you know, see a child differently and you see a different child. Mm. Um, I've done this work now my whole life and I've seen thousands. Of, I've worked with thousands and thousands of kids. I've never seen a bad kid. Mm. There isn't such a thing. They're just kids. Okay. But well, we can, we can make them bad. <laughs> Boy. Okay. So that's the first part. And it ties in with your second question, the interbrain. So this was discovered in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and then nobody believed it. 
uh, and then rediscovered by another American, Stephen Jay Gould, in 1978. And the idea is that all human babies, every baby, is born premature. Hmm. It, they're born somewhere between uh, four to six months premature. Hmm. And the reason for that is because nature um, discovered that there were two things about this new species that she really liked. One of them was that we walked around on two legs. Okay, so um, this gave us all kinds of advantages, including using our hands. But the other thing she liked was having a big brain that was a big brain creature. And the discovery she made was there's only so big a brain a female can give birth to and still remain bipedal. Mm. Mm. I, went, I once gave this lecture to about 5,000 kindergarten teachers and uh, a voice popped up from the back of the room and she said, Dr. Shanker, nature went too far. <laughs> so everybody <laughs> laughed. <laughs> everybody laughed and I said, what do you mean? And she said, have you never heard of an episiotomy? <laughs> The point is, <laughs> the size of the female, the size of the female cervix today, is the same size as it was three million years ago. Cervix hasn't oh, changed. Isn't that fascinating? So, it's very interesting. So, but our brain is way bigger today than those early hominids. Oh. So that means that most of our brain growth occurs after parturition at the moment of birth. In fact, the brain explodes. We form 700 new synapses every single second for the first years of life. It's an wow. Yeah, it's just extraordinary. So you got this brain. So we refer to this, so this is Gould's point. We refer to the fetus, to, to the newborn, as a fetus outside the womb. It's still a fetus, mm. completely helpless, completely dependent on you for everything. But now you've got an interesting, an interesting problem. Inside the womb, we have the umbilical cord. What takes the place of the umbilical cord if this baby is still a fetus? And the answer is the interbrain. Hmm. The, the interbrain is a wireless connection between the mother's brain and the baby's brain. So she is literally, and in fact, if you go back to what I said at the beginning, it's from her limbic system to the baby's limbic system because the prefrontal part of the baby's brain hasn't grown yet. It's just a little bit. So here we've got this wireless connection. We call it a Bluetooth connection. She literally feels what her baby is feeling. Now, let's say the baby is, is cold, okay? So baby doesn't know, it doesn't, it's nowhere near knowing that all it has to do is pull its blanket up. So she's monitoring the baby. She is regulating the baby. Mm. Now, remember what I said about Cannon's definition of self-regulation. Self-regulation is how we manage stress. Mm -hmm. In Cannon's model, the example he gives of stress is a cold temperature. Hmm. Cold is a physical stress. Anything that requires us to burn energy is a stress. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we have a problem. And the problem is that if my baby is cold, she's burning too much energy trying to keep an internal body temperature of 98.6. Mm -hmm. And that's energy that we want her spending on growth, the immune system, all that stuff. So by, by, um, by covering up my baby or whatever it is my baby needs, I reduce the amount of energy that she's spending on survival. And that energy goes into health. That energy goes into growth and metabolism. What's absolutely fascinating about this is we've now discovered that that interbrain connection between mother and baby lasts our entire life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so, no kidding. Yeah. I have two boys, I get it. <laughs> so, well, even to the point where there's now research uh, showing that if you have the elderly in isolation, they have uh, all sorts of medical problems. If we reintroduce interbrains into their life, their medical their medical conditions drop dramatically. So we always need an interbrain. There's no point. Of, and we need, and now you can sort of see why the pandemic has been so hard on us because it has uh, blocked, especially for children and teens, it's blocked their primary way of getting regulated in the original sense of managing our stress. So um, when we talk about the interbrain then, uh, you know, one of the, so we ran a, uh, let me just tell you quickly. So all this, we, we had a, a multi-year institute um, <laughs> where we had a brain institute on one side and a clinical institute on the other. So we did therapy with the kid and then we'd look at their brains, go back to therapy and so on. And one of the things we discovered was a lot of the children who came to see us, and we only had kids come who had problems, obviously, mm -hmm. but a lot of them didn't have problems in the home. Didn't have didn't, problems in the home? No, didn't have problems with mom and dad. Um, these were quirky kids, but mom and dad or single mom or grandparent, whoever was the primary caregiver had learned what the quirks were, had learned that, you know, mm. you know, if you know if he, if he freaks out when there's a bit of skin in the mashed potatoes don't peel the potatoes right um where the problems arose is when the kids went to school mm. because the teacher is still an interbrain and the kid was looking for safety and security from the teacher and not getting it Mm. And that's when we start to get those stress behaviors I mentioned. So that's a long, mm. that's a long response. But your question was pretty damn complicated. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> so interesting. So, um, so let me see if I get it. So in, in the example that you gave during the time of COVID, um, a lot of the maybe stress releasers or ways of dealing yeah, with things yeah. are eliminated. Like we're in, so we have like the number of, let's say strategies that can we use are actually reduced. Yes. Um, you know, the teacher is like trying to teach online on yeah. zoom, yeah, you know, yeah, all yeah, these yeah. kinds of crazy things. Yeah. And then in addition to that, um, the, when the, the, <laughs> I just can't even imagine when you have an electric con connection via Zoom <laughs> versus a face-to-face -face connection, yeah. some covered by masks, um, what that means yeah. for children who are trying to feel, if the child is trying to find safety and security with that child giver, they have that with yes. mom and dad, but maybe not with teacher, professor, whomever now comes into their life. So um how does one so basically it's i i can't even adapt because i don't even have lots of strategies to adapt and then i can't grow because i i'm not like learning how these new things so what what does this mean for for children at this point during covid who are on zoom and who don't have face to face interaction and uh, okay so I'm, I'm sorry my my questions are super complicated. I'm sorry. Very complicated again. It's a great question. Though. Yeah, just, just go, okay. We'll start from there. It was just uh, that, but let me even go back. So the inner brain, as I understand it, is this Bluetooth connection that happens with caregiver, whether that care or is it authority or is it any who who is the Bluetooth with? Definitely mom and dad. I get that, but. Who, but also teachers and anyone of that is supposed to be caretaking that child, boss, professor, coach. teacher, coach. Okay. Okay. So again, it's a very complicated question, right? Yeah. Um, now, I don't know. You, are you in Seattle? I am in Seattle. Right. So I don't know what your regulations are in Seattle. Up here in Canada, teachers aren't allowed to touch a child. 
Mm -hmm. That's true here in it Seattle. Is. So I had to get special permission uh, for the teachers that we were working with for them to be allowed to touch the child gently on their shoulder or their forearm. Mm. Um, because um, we regulate a child. So uh, mm. at the very start of the show, you made a wonderful point. Uh, we the most powerful tool that we have for regulating a child is our voice. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we have all kinds of videos where uh, when we do dem when we do live, we show people the effective voice on newborns that are uh, that are, you know, just way overwhelmed by the birth process, you know, and they're suddenly exposed to all these stresses that they hadn't experienced in the womb. So, you know, bright lights, mm. temperature. And um, the voice itself is enough to calm the limbic alarm. Mm. Why? What's it saying? Mm. So what it's saying to the child is, you are not alone. Mm. Um, there is someone here, and I will make you safe and I will protect you. And that's what the child's always looking for from the in, from an interbrain relationship. Mm. Someone who makes them feel safe and secure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The reason why um, we had to get permission for touching is because touch comes in as number two. Mm. Oh, that's so sad for little kids. Isn't it though? Seriously, mm. right? Yeah. Um, Sigh. You know, well, <laughs> okay. So uh, what do they not need? Well, what they don't need is for us to explain what, <laughs> or, or, or lecture. Um, because, um, so I mentioned those three brains, the uh, new brain, the middle brain, the older brain, limbic brain, and the reptilian. So in self-reg, we call it the blue brain is the thinking brain. And that's because in neuroimaging, that part of the brain is in blue. Mm -hmm. uh, the part below, the limbic, is red. Mm -hmm. So we talk about when a child goes red brain. Mm -hmm. When a child goes red brain, they're not going to be able to process what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So all of these, uh, you know, and if you're stern, um, or you're threatening, that makes it even worse mm. um, because the kid's in red brain. Uh, what we've got to do is get them out of red brain. And we do that with our voice. We soften our gaze, uh, a gentle touch, usually on the back of the forehand or the shoulder. Those are non-threatening for a job. Shoulder, shoulder and back of hand. Okay. Yeah. If it's not our kid. Yeah. Um, so when eventually, you know, so look, kids screw up, they're going to screw up all the time. The time to teach them is not when they're in red brain. Right. They're not going to learn a damn thing. So what we try to do is, um, you know, uh, wait your, you know, wait for the opportunity when they really are in blue brain. One of the things that uh, shocked me um, was um, one of our parents said this to me. And I put out a, you know, we have like thousands and thousands of people in Canada that do this stuff. And uh, I put out a call. Has anybody else seen this? I got hundreds of responses um, that when their teenager went red brain, mm -hmm. the best way they could communicate with them was by going for a drive. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. fascinating because yeah. you're, you're not looking at each other. Looking can be a threat. The, the, I guess the motor must be calming, soothing the nervous system. And now the kid starts to open up. Wow. Um, uh, so, the, but the point is, you know, what do, you know, somebody said to me once, what do I do if I don't have a car? Can I do it on a bike? <laughs> I don't think a bike would work, <laughs> but. <laughs> oh my gosh. Interesting. Okay. Got it. So it's the voice, the softer gaze, the softer voice a touch and shoulder and back of hand. These are kinds of things to kind of regulate the child. And, um, and, and while you're at it, 
um, you know, stop and look, you, you know, obviously this kid is overstressed or they wouldn't be in red brain. So now we're going to quickly go through our mind. We, we, this is what we teach our parents. When this happens, you know, your kid's done something that's making you nuts. Right. So this is going to happen 20 times a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we teach our parents to stop and ask why and why now. Hmm. The reason we do that is um, you used a very interesting term a, a few minutes back. There is a contagion effect between limbic systems. Hmm. So if my kid is hyper aroused, I instantly become as a parent hyper aroused. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at people say, I won't mention names, but at a political rally of some sort, yeah. uh, you will see how that limbic contagion sweeps through a crowd. Mm. Our brains were wired for contagion. Mm. But if my child's hyper aroused and I'm supposed to regulate my kid, I can't do it if I'm hyper aroused. Right. So um, you were actually hyper aroused when mm-hmm. you sat down. Mm -hmm. Uh, you were hyper aroused when I heard you on the phone. Mm -hmm. Uh, You've been doing what you did for an awful long time because, and I'm serious, Mm -hmm. uh, because with practice, you can ground yourself within seconds. Mm -hmm. There is a practice effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I knew right away when I was watching you, I knew right away that this is someone who's been meditating for a long time. Mm. That's funny. I have been. Um, so what we want mom but you know we're gonna we're, we're gonna assume that this is all new to mom and dad mm-hmm. um and so what we want to do is we want to break that contagion mm-hmm. if they ask why it gives them a chance to do what you did it gives mm-hmm. them a chance to ground and and now we want them to ask why in a genuinely inquisitive way what were the stresses what, why is my child so overstressed and there's a real good lesson here don't jump at the obvious. Um, there's always going to be some obvious stress that hits you, you know, so I got a young teenage girl, you know, and it was some emotional stress because of the kids at school. But there's an awful lot else. There's all, we call it five domains of stress, mm-hmm. physical, emotional, cognitive, social, and pro-social. So we start with the physical. Um, Okay, so let's just take as an example. Uh, there's an example in the book that you mentioned, self reg of a 13-year-old. And um, she freaked out. She asked her mom for a pink hoodie. You call them hoodies in the States? Mm-hmm. Okay. She asked her mom for a pink hoodie like all the other girls at school. So uh, mom goes at her lunch hour, and there are all a lot of pink hoodies. So she buys her a gray one. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so it's like complete meltdown. And so they've been having some, uh, they've been having some trouble for a while, mother daughter, which is why they came to see us. Um, So the mom um, is already I won't swear on the show, but the mom swore (laughs) what she wanted to say to the kid. Uh, because she'd given up her lunch hour for this. Right. But she said, the doctor said, I'm not allowed to say anything. So she goes out into the hall. It was, and she, and she, and we taught her some breathing because uh, deep breathing, belly breathing really does lower the heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and she went back into the room and then she did the following. And this is really instructive. The first thing she did, the kid was curled up in a fetal position. And if that's not on her bed that's not indicative i don't know what is it tells us she has regressed Mm. so the first thing mom does is she turns off the light Mm. Um, can i do one a little bit more brain science yeah sure just a tiny tiny bit okay so when the when the kid's in red brain it gets real hard to talk Mm. and so you'll notice with your child that when they're really worked up they can't tell it you know you say what's wrong Right. And they can't answer that. Uh, and so the speech centers, it's in the blue brain, it's actually seized up. Mm. Um, and so what we need to do 
is the kid on the bed has regressed to that pre-social state, that, that, that reptilian brain state. And mm. we need to reestablish contact between us. Mm. Uh, we need her, we need to bring her back into, into the interbrain is what we got to do. Mm. But now you can't do it through speech. So Doc said, I'm not allowed to do it. Well, how do I communicate with her? So one of the great discoveries made by uh, another American, an American uh, psycholinguist called Lois Bloom, is they can't talk, but they can still communicate. That part of the brain is a different part of the brain. So what you do is um, uh, we wanted mom, uh, we wanted that physical contact. So mom ha wants to scratch the kid. The kid loved being scratched as a baby. Mm -hmm. But you can't just do it. If you do it, you got to get permission. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do I get permission? You can't say, would you like me to scratch you? You won't get an answer. So what you do, um, there's different ways of doing this, but this is how she did it. You, you, she put her finger inside the child's fist. And she said, would you like me to scratch your back? Squeeze once if you'd like that. Mm, nice. Yep. It's a good story. So the kid squeezes. Now what you've just done with that squeeze is you've reestablished the interbrain. Mm. So now uh, they had been having fights that were going on for hours every single night. Wow. Because you're trying to do it, right? You're trying to reason. My kid's being nuts. Well, yeah, it's red brain. They're irrational. Mm. So now um, she's sitting there. She's scratching the kid's back. And then after about 15 minutes, the child says, I want to go to sleep now because you've mm. calmed down her nervous system. Mm. And the last thing she says is, I love you, mommy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> <That's> because, <ever. laughs> because the association, right, is of the security that mom gave her when she was a baby. That memory I talked about of the voice on the baby mm. it's always there it's deep inside us mm. okay so um, mom goes into the into the hall and she thinks holy shit this stuff is really good uh, <laughs> you know i'm gonna sell it um, <laughs> but then she starts going through it and then she feels bad you know that she caused it all so she's decided that um the next day she's going to take her daughter after school and they'll go to a, a, the big mall in another town and get her find her the pink one and the child comes downstairs in the morning wearing the gray hoodie. Wow. So in this case, we would have jumped at the, you know, we would assume right away that it was the hoodie that was the problem. But in fact, there was an awful lot going on in this child's mm. life. And she was so overstressed that the gray hoodie on top of all that was more than she could handle. So she had a stress explosion. So oh, wow. when, so we never don't jump to the conclusion that this is what it is. Tick off the things, you know, is she tired? Is she, you know, is she working too hard? Did she eat properly? Did she sleep enough? All these questions. And of course I told you they were having these two hour flights fights every night. So we know right away the kids physically exhausted emotionally drained and so on mm -hmm. so you know we kind of want parents to become we call them stress detectives you mm -hmm. know yes and and by the way you know you're not gonna I, i've got a 19 year old and i'm still totally puzzled by this kid <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny so the are these part I assume that in that example you gave us the five steps of self regulation so yeah so the first one is you reframe so that's ask yourself is it misbehavior or is it stress behavior so mm -hmm. parents are going to ask you right they're going to say well how do I know if it's stress behavior um there's all kinds of give, giveaways tells uh their tone of voice changes mm. uh the pitch goes up uh, they'll speak either a little faster or a little slower or not at all. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't speak like normally. Mm -hmm. um, their eye gaze changes. They won't look at you in the eyes. Their facial complexion changes. It becomes pale. And that's a result mm. of the blood being pumped to the heart. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot. So you have to you know, read the book, please. Mm -hmm. um, 
There are lots of signs that tell us when it's stress behavior. So that's number one. What am I dealing with here? If it's stress behavior, I'm going to go into soothing mode. Okay. Two, I'm going to figure out what are the stresses. And we look at the five domains and we always look at all five domains. Mm -hmm. Three, we're going to reduce the stresses. Now, this is an interesting question for the pandemic because um, obviously there is a limit to how much, you know, we can't, you know, how much of the pandemic stress can I reduce? Well, mm -hmm. not very much. Mm -hmm. So we reduce the stresses that we can. So we reduce the other stresses. And, you know, social media is not a substitute for face to face for, mm. uh, but it's not bad. And in fact, some kids do have done better on uh, the kids that had social problems before are actually doing better. But what we want, but what we want to re remember is that when they get overstressed, they regress, just like that 13 year old. Mm -hmm. If they've regressed, what's their number one need for regulation? Mm -hmm. It's it's their parents. Mm -hmm. So the child's need for the parent is uh, dramatically increased. However, that does not mean that they need the parent to uh, explain everything for them or to tell them what a great kid they are or that this is going to pass. Or Because when they were two and got overstressed, I'm going to guess that most parents didn't explain to their, to their baby that, that mm -hmm. this is going to pass that you're just, you're just hungry now. And um, what the child needs if they've regressed is the same uh, cosseting that makes them feel safe and secure. Not being, not, they don't need, they don't need information. In fact, information is gonna, gonna stress them out even further. Mm. Step four is an interesting one. Uh, we need our kids to become calm. And we have been worried about this for at least a decade, uh, the signs that we were seeing a generation that doesn't know what calm means, mm -hmm. doesn't know what calm feels like. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's all kinds of ways. Um, I can only tell you what I did with my own children. Uh, so there are th certain things that like what you and I do really doesn't work that well with most kids. It's hard to get kids to do uh, say, uh, belly breathing exercise, mm -hmm. um, they get squirmy. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do, what I did with my own children was, uh, I live on an island. Um, and so I would, when they're hyper aroused, you know, I'd say, come on, let's, let's go out into the dock and have an extra reception bath. Mm. So the point of an extra, extra reception bath is how many so I'd start off, you know, so tell me what you feel now. Mm. What do you feel on your face? Mm. What do you feel? Um, what do you hear? Do you mm. smell anything? Mm. Can you taste anything? Can you taste the water? Right. Now, by doing this, it's a very interesting aspect of neuroscience. Um, there is a part of the brain called the default mode. And when we're overstressed, it works like crazy. And it spins the same record over and over and over. So we call it monkey brain, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to turn off that monkey brain. I want to turn off my kids, um, you know, whatever their gnawing anxiety is or worries or intrusive thoughts. But you can't do it by saying, turn it off. You can't mm -hmm. tell them. That. You can't tell your, your nobody can. You can't tell your, your monkey brain, this isn't a good idea. I need to calm down. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing when we focus them on um, this thing called extraception, or you can do interception, what's going on inside your body, mm. is it causes a switch in the brain. It, we call it flipping the switch. It activates the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that we use for being aware. Mm. So when you meditate, that's what you're mm. activating. And what it does by activating that is it 
deactivates. Mm. Yeah, it's cool, eh? Yeah, it um, deactivates limbi- the, um, it, it deactivates uh, the default mode. Wow, that's so cool. So being in awareness, so basically presence and awareness is the yes. little switch. Yeah, and so what you've done now by flipping your switch, by the way, I owe this to another American, Alan Fogel, who's a good friend of mine, uh, who wrote a book about, about just this called Body Sense. He was the one who mm-hmm. discovered all this. Hmm. Um, by flipping the switch, what you've just done is you just shut off the energy tap mm. be- because you're burning an enormous amount of energy when you're in monkey brain. Why are you burning so much energy? Well, it's because you're very tense. And Mm. tension is basically muscles are just engorged. Uh, So that's why heart rate goes up. That's why blood pressure go up. Mm. So if I can flip the switch, I just stopped that flow of, of energy which was originally designed for fight or flight, which was originally designed for, you know, predators, whatever. And now in this new state, some pretty incredible things happen as happened with you. Within seconds, you became incredibly focused Hmm. because the brain is a gas guzzler. Brain uses up 20% of our body's glucose. Mm. so i got to give my brain so by shutting off the energy that i'm spending on jiggling my feet that's energy that now can go into thinking to problem solving oh my gosh what a brilliant i have to say um, i've interviewed quite a few people on um, neuroscience and stress and you are one of the clearest communicators and educators uh teachers i really wow that's great. I learned a ton. <laughs> I'm so thankful. I will use all of these on my children, on myself. Um, and um, we've been talking to Dr. Stuart Shanker about his book, self Rag, And um, in his book will be these five steps, um, more information about um, self-regulation, the five domains of stress, more details about that as well. Um, how wonderful. Thank you. Okay, keep it up, CJ. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I hope your ankle feels better. Yeah, me too. All right, take care. (laughs) Thank you so much. Have a good day. You're welcome.